please provide. Let us pray, and then I'll get into the preaching. So, so kids, kids can go that side, to the other side. Um, Given is there. So we've got a lot of kids today. Um, you can really go to the other side as we are about to preach the word. We in James chapter five, verses seven. James five, verses seven to eleven. 7 to 11. So privileged, um, that sometimes I don't think we realize how awkward and strange it is to live in Gauteng. I think you only realize how awkward and strange it is once you go to other provinces. And then you see well, Gauteng is just a, a mixture of just a lot of movement, a lot of noise and a lot of um, different cultures which is great but at the same time you realize that we we are not as as perfect as sometimes we think we are and I recognize that a few months back when I had to go to Devon and I did not go to Devon during this time in December right November December when everybody goes to Devon I went to Devon during the middle of the year and I, I was I was met with a with a culture shock when I was there in Devon. Uh, but one one of the things that really really I realized which we are really really impatient people in Kaldi. I realized that mustn't forget to me. We are really really impatient people. So I was driving with my friend. I just went to see my friend in Devon. It was during the year, not at this time. And it's Wednesday morning. People are driving at 80 kilometers an hour on the main highway. And I'm shocked because I'm like, Kandi, I thought that, uh, you know, during the year, Devon is different. But I realized that they actually maintain the holiday spirit throughout the year. It's a very slow kind of a town. You don't have, um, at least in certain places, you don't have it as fast as it is here. And so we were driving from the south coast towards Moses Mabida as I was in the car. I was on the driver's seat and my driver who's from Devon is driving at 80 kilometers an hour. And for some reason, hey, man, I super, I'm a parent, not I, man. Why are we driving so slow, though? <laughs> Why are we driving so slow? The howling, impatient spirit started to take over. Would you know? And by the way, I anyway. We are not rushing anyway. We are just going there. We are on time. But it's just me and the fact that I'm used to things being fast. You know, when you wake up here in the morning. You know, things are beeping, taxis are going somewhere, people are trying to get on your way, everybody is, is rushing to work, and you know, it's such a buzz, but it was such a different experience um, in, in, in Devon. But just like us being impatient, as Christians, we can also be tempted with an artistic impatient and complain. We tempted to spiritually to press our hooter, to shout, and at even time to run and cast at people that are making things difficult, which is in Dozambe, the way it's gonna Zambe now. I had a meeting again this past week with a long time friend of mine. 
who just met me and as we were speaking, his life was falling apart. His marriage was not going well. He did not intend to, that they separate with the wife, but it seems they're separating. His career is not going well to the point where he's had to go back to Ekaya and live with his mom. He was complaining about how difficult that is. But there's something that he said that struck me that I think we need to be aware of. He said to me, I did everything right. I was serving in my church. I kept myself for marriage. I did everything we must do for us to be a good Christian. But my life is still falling apart. He couldn't understand how is it that I'm doing everything right, but my life is still falling apart. You see, it's hard for him to be patient because he has his own pictures, he has his own way of how he thinks God must work. And because God did not work in that certain way, he finds himself discouraged. He finds himself to the point of, he's even said, I don't even know the last time I've gone to church. I don't even know the last time that I've prayed. Complaining, which in this text is actually the opposite of patience is not about the circumstances that happen to us. It's, it's really about how we respond to those circumstances. At the heart of not being patient is a lack of trust in God. Sometimes we might not even voice out to God these things we are not happy with. But through complaining and swearing, our hearts are exposed that we have grown impatient with God. So the text is going to anticipate that and so what James is going to do, he's going to give us pictures of patience. He is going to take Satan certain legends from the past. And he's going to show us what it looks like to be patient through these pictures. So that's where we're going this morning. We're looking at three characters that James puts up on the screen as an example of how we can imitate patience and endurance. Let me say that again. James is looking at three characters that he's going to put up in front of us as an example of how we can endure, as an example of how we can be patient. He is not really telling us the how, but through these characters, he's going to show us, in a sense, how they were able to be patient and how they were able to enjoy. Amen. The first character that James brings up is the farmer. The farmer. Look at verse 7. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and the late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Verse 9, do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. In the previous section, we have James rebuking the rich for hoarding their wealth instead of being generous. He rebukes them for abusing their workers. He rebukes them for paying them unjustly. But now he's saying, therefore, brethren, James is about to change his audience from speaking to the persecutors. He is now speaking to the persecuted. They would have needed to be reminded to be patient. As I'm sure you have heard of the persecution they were facing in the various trials James talks about in chapter 1. In chapter 1, James does talk about those trials. And so the illustration of a farmer, it fits out very perfectly towards this situation. James says the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient until it gets the early and the late rains. The early rains in Palestine arrive around October and November, and the late rains in March, April, just before the harvest. 
So the farmer has to plant his crops, and having planted his crops, the farmer must wait. But the problem is that the nurturing, the problem is that the nutrients and the growth of his crops are dependent on something outside of him. They are dependent on the rain. Something entirely out of the farmer's control. So the farmer has to wait. We, he has to wait. We know just a little bit about that. We've had some time where we have drought in our country. People experiencing that. You can imagine how difficult it must be for the farmers not to have rain for their crops. They have to wait about something that's outside their control. That's the nature of this picture of patience. You, you've done what you can, but you are waiting for help from a source outside of your control. This is the hardest thing for us Christians to do. Just to wait. At least in traffic, and doctor's office, you have this assurance that it's just a matter of time. But waiting on God, you don't even know if the rain is going to come. You're just waiting. You're just waiting. What must you do while you're waiting? He tells you there, verse 8. Be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Verse 9. Do not complain, brethren, against one another. Strengthen your hearts, don't complain. Verse 9. Strengthen your hearts, don't complain. The word for strengthen there is the same word Luke used when he told the parable of Lazarus. You remember the conversation between Abraham and the rich man. He said, but Abraham, <coughs> but Abraham said, child, remember that during your life, you received your good things and likewise Lazarus' bad things. But now he's been comforted here and you are in agony. And besides this, between us and you, there is a chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over here will not be able and that none may cross over here. The word fix is the word for strengthen. To strengthen is to fix. To strengthen is to be immovable. To strengthen is to be steadfast. To strengthen is to be mentally settled. And that shows itself in how? In not complaining. That's why he says, don't complain, brethren, so that you yourselves may not be judged. The complaining that he's talking about here is against one another. Against your fellow brother. The complaining against your fellow sister. This is a way to expose whether you are patiently waiting or not. Even as mature Christians, we can develop this habit of always complaining against a brother or sister who's not doing things exactly like we want them to. Right? In the marriage, you can get to the point where you complain so much against your partner that you can just put out any little flame of growth that God is doing. You can get to a point of just finding fault with everything that your partner or other people do. There's always something wrong that that person is not doing. Cooking or being patient with each other's flaws or complaining about not getting enough attention, complaining about this and that. Even with issues of injustice, we have to trust a source outside of ourselves that he is going to make things right. We have to trust a source outside of ourselves that he is going to make things right. Yes, we fight injustice and oppression when we can. But at the back of our minds, we remind ourselves that it is he who is ultimately going to fix all the problems of the world. Otherwise, we become what many Facebook, Facebook users have become. We become bitter. We become angry. We become argumentative. We become discouraged. With the bad news that's hitting us at 200 kilometers an hour in our country, you get the sense that everyone is crying for justice, right? 
there's a sense that everybody's crying for justice. And we keep on blaming each other for not doing enough for solving the other person's problem. So James says, be steadfast. James says, be mentally settled. James says, don't complain. A good working definition for patience is, I quote, quietness of heart and rest of soul in the face of uncomfortable delay. Quietness of heart and rest of soul in the face of uncomfortable delay. Rest in the Lord, I quote from Psalms, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil doing. For evil doers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Patience goes to the heart, not just outwardly being calm, but a heart that is content in the midst of uncomfortable delay. So the farmer is a very good example of patience. Let's look at the second picture that James gives us. Verse 10. He gives us the picture of the prophets. He gives us a picture of the prophets. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. Well, who were those prophets? After the author of Hebrews has spoken about legends such as Abraham, Jacob, Esau, Moses, heroes of the faith, he says in Hebrews 11, verses 32 to 38, What more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword from weakness, were made strong because they were mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings, scourgings, yes, chains, imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They were about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom this world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. The prophets, according to James, should be an example of enduring suffering and patience. That's what patience looks like. Patience looks like Jeremiah, whose 40 year ministry, according to records, did not produce one single convert. For 40 years, Jeremiah was preaching the gospel, nobody got saved. They kept on ridiculing him that he must stop preaching wrong against them. They started to criticize him that what you are not preaching is not the word of God. And he kept on preaching year after year after year for 40 years without a single convert. He preached the message of repentance and judgment to a stubborn people for 40 years. Not once did he see his message softening the hearts and minds of stubborn people. He got called at the age of 17. He didn't marry. He didn't have children. And his close friends rejected him. He preached passionately to a stubborn people, yet it was like he was preaching to a brick wall. James says, take heart, strengthen your soul. Patience here is not like a farmer who has to wait on something outside of his control. Patience here 
with the prophet is needed in the midst of persecution and trials. It's needed in the midst of persecution and trials for being a Christian who takes the word of God seriously. Being a follower of Jesus, friends will think that you are crazy. You need patience. Listen to Jeremiah as he pours out his heart in the book of Lamentation. I am the man who sin affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He's lamenting. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old. He has broken my bones. He has besieged me, surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He says, I remember my affliction, my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I will remember them. My soul is downcast. I'm depressed, Jeremiah says. Yet this I call to mind. Therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore I will wait. Here's the conclusion. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To those who seek him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The last picture that he uses of patience is the picture of Job. The picture of Job. This is more personal now. This is more of physical trials. Personal physical trials. Look at what he says in James. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. I thought he, he was going to say, you have heard of Job's story. You've heard of his story. And the main point of Job is that if you suffer, you're going to get double for your trouble. I thought he was going to say, you have heard of Job that he lost everything when he started. But when he finished, he's going to get everything back. You too are going to get everything back. That's not what he says. Do you know what the story of Job is about? It's about God's compassion and mercy. You thought he was going to say, Job, you know how unfair life is and how terrible the circumstances is. James says the main point you can learn from Job is that God is compassionate and merciful. Here, it's not just about needing patience because of things outside of your control. It's not just needing patience because of persecution. Here, it's needing patience because you're facing personal trials. Trials that are physical. Trials related to the family. Trials that they take the bottom out. Have you ever faced or known someone who's faced the trial that is so hard that the bottom literally comes out. The very thing, foundation you are standing in is, is taken away from your feet and you have no standing place. That's what happened to Job, right? Everything is going well at one point. Then the next thing he hears that they have taken his kids, that they have taken all his wealth and he loses it all almost in all in a day everything else changes see my friend who I spoke to earlier on many times we condemn the prosperity message but sometimes we ourselves have adopted a prosperity mindset without us saying it I serve therefore God must reward me I've been good, therefore God owes me something. 
We might not say yes, we are preaching the prosperity message, but we have almost made God to be the person that is like a genie. He must respond to our wishes. James says, when you face trials, remember that God is compassionate. He cares. When you face trials, remember that He's merciful. Meaning in the midst of the pain, there's some good that he's still doing and he's still giving you what you don't deserve. That's what the book of Job is about. What happens to Job is a picture of God's compassion and God's mercy. Your life might not end up like Job. You might not get double for your trouble, right? But guess what James wants us to know? That God is merciful and he's compassionate. That's the outcome of Job. For him, it ended up at the end of his life, he got everything back. That's how God shows his mercy and compassion. For you, there's a thousand ways that God could be showing compassion and mercy in the midst of the trial you are going through. Can you say amen? There's something that God is always doing around. Around the trial, if we look hard enough. There's something that God is always doing around the trial. What is the motivation that G James gives for us to be patient? Are we supposed to just buckle up, put our seatbelt on with all our willpower, and just be patient? And just master our patience. No. Yes, it requires effort in doing certain things and changing certain behaviors to be patient, but that's where that's not where the motivation comes from. Look at where James goes for motivation. Verse, verse 7. He says, Be patient, brothers and sisters, until what? Until the Lord's coming. Did you see that? Yes. Be patient until the Lord's coming. Verse 9. Don't grumble against one another, the brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Did you see that? Yes. There is this picture of agency that James is painting for us. In, in chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, he rebukes the man who wants to plan his future but not include God in it. The, the indictment for this man is that he thinks he will have all the time in the world to enjoy his labors. He doesn't recognize that God is in control of man's affairs. They're facing various kinds of trials. Some of them are experiencing favoritism in how they're being treated. This is what James talks about. So when James is reminding them that Jesus is coming back, He's reminding them that the judge of the earth will surely do right. It must have come as an encouragement for them. That when Jesus comes back, he's going to make things right and beautiful. He's going to right the wrongs. He's going to wipe away the tears. He's going to give justice that they never got here on earth. So in the meantime, James, James says, be patient. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, be patient. Be patient. As a cliche and difficult as it is, that is what we need. We need patience. This is the worst thing you can say to a child. Be patient. But you and me know that the best thing for the child is not to give them what they want in that moment. It's for them to be patient until they get home so that they can have what they ask for. I think when Christ comes, we are going to wonder why we were so worried about the troubles in this world. When Christ comes, we are going to ask yourself why we're so worried about the troubles in this world. This is a good way to encourage yourself. If Christ was here right now, would I be worried about this and that? That's a good reminder for yourself. If Christ was here right now, 
would I be stressed and depressed about this? He will be worth the patience. So the coming of the Lord serves as a motivation for us to keep on being patient. So we don't pull ourselves by bootstraps or force patience. It's motivated, it's fueled by the second coming of Jesus. So if you feel sometimes that, why don't we just get along? If you feel, why is the world so bad? Why are Christians hated so much? Why is there so much conflict? Why is there so much injustice in the world? Remember the farmer waiting for the rain. Remember the prophets persevering in persecution. Remember Job. God is compassionate and merciful. But above all, remember Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the perfect Pishai patience. Was being treated, treated unjustly with kangaroo court proceedings, was just called upon as you heard last week, people were just called upon to lie on him. He did not fight that. When the system of Rome was unfair against him, he didn't remain bitter and blame everybody around him for his situation, but he submitted his situation to the Father. That's why I said at the heart of impatience, it's a lack of trust in God. At the heart of somebody who's impatient, it's a lack of trust in God. Like, I don't trust God that you have this thing locked up right now. I don't trust that you are for me. That's why I need to handle this thing by myself. That's the heart of impatience, a lack of trust in God. But the heart of impatience should be a surrendered heart that has learned to say, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours be done. Mm -hmm. If you are here, you're not a Christian, you're angry and impatient against what you see around you. Maybe you are angry or impatient about what has happened to you. Welcome to the club. We all see it. We are not happy about it too. The thing that makes us hopeful is that we know the person who's going to make it right. We have a relationship with the person that's going to fix it all. We still do what we need to do. But at the back of our minds, we trust God to fix injustice in his own way. We know the president. We know the king. We know the fixer. We know the one who's going to fix it all. And he has promised us that he will come back and make all things right. And we believe his words when he says that he will actually come back and make things right. But even now, before he comes back, we are still seeing glimpses of how he is already making things right. Oh, that God will teach us how to be patient. Young people, may God teach you how to be patient. Be patient for the right person to come to you. Amen. Amen. Be patient for the right job that you need. Be patient for the right spouse. Be patient for your kids to do right. Be patient. Why? It's because we know Christ. We know that Jesus is the judge of the earth. He's the ultimate judge of the earth. James says, don't complain. Don't complain. Complaining 
is the opposite of patience in this text. So we know you're not patient when you complain. May the Lord help us to be patient. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Baba, ne te imi ni ngosi esi esi ispona ni esi traba ngo kuti kambi fanele zinzala ni niskatsi. Bati baba si abonga ngo kuti ge wenu niskatsa ko esi mfanyi nisindi. Baba, your time is not our time. You are God. You have a plan. You know what you are doing. Like the farmer, Baba, teach us how to wait. Teach us how to wait for you to do what you need to do. Like the prophet, Lord, teach us how to continually be faithful whilst waiting, faithfully preaching, faithfully going to that job, faithfully studying, faithfully doing what we need to do whilst you do what you need to do. Like Job, teach us how to be patient. Job said, "My redeemer lives. I know that my redeemer lives. When physical trials hit us, when when spiritual trials hit us, to the point where we want to give up, Baba, even then, teach us how to be patient. Teach us what it means to be patient." In Jesus' name, Amen.